So welcome to the third screencast of Chemical Kinetics. We're going to do something a bit more data driven and a bit more process driven than before where we were talking about concepts. And specifically, we're going to try and figure out how do we get a rate law? So we know rates and we can define that by dy and dx and so on. Uh, and then that's proportional to k uh, times some particular concentrations. And these are usually raised to some kind of power of some description. It doesn't matter what these letters or numbers actually are. Uh, how do we get access to them? How can we work that out? So this is something called the initial rates method. The name isn't really important. We just need to know that it is how do we get uh, this when we're talking about lab practice. And so, I mean, again, we think about that whole Johnstone's triangle thing. This is really a relationship between macroscopic world and the symbolic world. So we're looking at the abstract maths and we're looking at what data can we get from the lab. And this is kind of connecting the two clever, isn't it? Uh, so the order of reaction, if we can define our rate, uh, now this rate zero means that we are interested in the initial rate, that is rate when time is equal to zero. This is where we are really interested in. So that rate is defined as dA by dt, or dB by dt, or dC by dt, with the positive or negatives representing whether they are products or reactants. And that is equal to kind of a generic rate law here. So this concentration, again, at time zero, and two exponents that we don't know yet. We don't know what these are. Like I keep saying, this can only be derived experimentally. Uh, so this is the experiment we would do for it. So here we keep B constant. And A is varied. Uh, so what we will find is that we get three different rates out. It's because as the concentration of A increases, the rate will increase. That's what this rate law says. But how does it increase and by how much? So let me just scribble those out of the way. This is what we've done. We've done th three experiments. You might want more in reality, but there is the red rate here. It was our first experiment where the concentration of A was low. There's a yellow one where it's kind of in the middle and then the green one, which is really fast. So you can see these three arrows here represent the rate at time equals zero. We've sort of got a gradient or we've plotted down a graph, tried to get a straight line, and we've worked out the rate from that. So we get three values. These are just three numbers representing the speed of the reaction that defined this way. So let's look at what we would do if it was just straight A to B. Uh, so our rate is equal to K A to the power of something. Now we want to take a logarithm of it. So if you're not familiar with logarithms, this is kind of what's happening. We take ln something, and this is an actual logarithm, uh, which just basically means putting ln behind it. It's about exponents. And you'll realize that this exponent now comes down to here. So it becomes a linear equation. We've taken a log of a rate, and then we've got this. It is a linear equation. So if it's a linear equation, it becomes a straight line. Now, physical chemists, and um, particularly when we're in thermodynamics and kinetics, we like linear equations. If we can linearize an equation, we can do a lot more with it, and we can figure out a lot of things. Um, so there is a recurring theme in kinetics of taking logarithms, um, mostly because <clears throat> things do react in terms of exponential decays and so on. So if we take a log, things work out quite nicely. So let's look at our A times B idea. <clears throat> we take the logarithm of it, uh, our exponents come down to the to the front here, uh, and we take log of the rate is equal to log A plus the log A plus log B. So that's the other law of logarithms. When we multiply things, they become addition down here. Uh, now, our experiment, we said B was constant. We kept B as constant. So what happens is this entire part of the equation becomes constant. We also find that this part of the equation, because it is a part about the rate constant, also becomes constant. <clears throat> okay, so the only variable in this equation that we produced is log A. This should, in theory, be a constant as well, because this is the one we're getting from the rate law. Uh, so let's rearrange that a little bit and show you what's happening here. What we get is a straight line graph. 
y equals mx plus c. Again, physical chemists love y equals mx plus c. When we put that, uh, we can put an equation into that form. It's beautiful. We can get any kind of result we like out of it, and it's really easy to find. And what it turns out is y is log of our rates. We did three experiments, so we can get three values of that. Uh, this is a constant, which don't worry about it. And we also got three concentrations here. So if we plot the data, we can work out this. And to a degree, we can also work out that. So m here, our gradient, is equal to the exponent. So try to synthesize the two things we've done here. We have done an experiment with three rates that we got out, three initial rates at the very beginning at time equals zero. And then we did this with the equation here. So this is what we did in the lab. And this is our set of equations. So we try to convert our hypothetical um, rate law into y equals mx plus c. And we've got data we can now plot. So our first rate plots to here, our second rate plots to here, and our third rate plots to here. And that gradient is equal. is equal to a r exponent. So if our rate is equal to a concentration raised to a certain power, the gradient is this. And so all the consequences of the fact we've linearized this equation by taking logarithms and then plug some data into it. So let's see what that looks like in terms of <clears throat> actual data when we put some real numbers into this. So here are three sets of numbers, three concentrations that we have, and we also picked out three rates. So these are three things that we've done. This is an actual experiment for now. Okay, what it means and what chemicals we use don't matter. This is just a kind of an example, but we're putting numbers into it anyway. And now if you take logs of all of the numbers involved, you get this. Minus 5.3, minus 4.1, minus 3.5, then 14, 13, and 11, and so on. Um, <clears throat> now, if you type this into a calculator, you might not get these values. So you need to make sure that you're taking into account the fact that this is, in fact, millimoles and times 10 to the minus 7. Now, that's not 100% important. You'll find out if, if you plot the data anywhere without taking that into account, you still get the right answer. Uh, you just won't get these negative numbers. Um, it's, it's a nice thing about logs. You know, we can kind of ignore orders of magnitude. They sometimes tend to cancel out. <clears throat> so let's have a look at the actual data here. Here are our x values. Here are our y values. And if we actually plot these, we get a straight line. So I did this in Excel. Uh, you can do whatever you like. Um, learn how to use Excel. It's a really powerful tool for this sort of thing. Uh, and the gradient, when we actually work it out, is 2.0082. Pretty much close to 2. It rounds off quite nicely. So within experimental error, we can get um, what is <clears throat> our rate law. So here's some more data, and we'll cover this in the lecture, exactly what's happening. Uh, we've changed the concentration of A we've changed the concentration of B, and we've got two concentrations of B that are the same. So we can use that initial rates method to try and work out the exponent A, and then we can plug the rest of the data in to get B. So we'll cover this a bit later. So let's go through this process again. Right, the initial rates method is used to find a rate law. That's K, A, B, and we're interested in what are these numbers here. So we vary one and we keep the other one constant. And so if we plot the natural logs of this equation, uh, we can get a y equals mx plus c graph. So our multiple bits of data should form a straight line where the gradient is equal to whatever our exponent is up here. So a bit of a convoluted um, procedure, or maybe it's quite a simple procedure to you. Either way, we will meet up in the lecture and do a bit more on it and try and you know, plug some more data into this and try and get you used to it.